Uh, welcome everyone to the first webinar uh, on this new webinar series on machine learning. Um, the first web webinar is today. It will be on machine learning in climate science. Our, our speaker is Marlene Kreschmer from University of Reading. Um, and now I will give you a, a, just a brief summary about the code of conduct for this presentation. Okay, the code of conduct, it's really simple. It's the same that we use in previous webinars. Uh, please be polite and respectful to the speakers and to the, all the participants. We now, how, now here we have 38 and now we have also people in YouTube. So for both platforms, please, um, please be polite. And this meeting is being recorded. Um, we, will, we will upload the video uh, to YouTube in the, um, in the in the upcoming hours and if you want to to make a question you can do it in the chat box and after marlene's presentation we will read the questions um here in you in zoom and also in youtube and your your question will be answered there so i will give the floor now to julia she will present the the activity and she will present the speaker hello everyone it's great to have you here um, so I just want to mention that this uh, webinar series is part of a larger, larger activity that YES is organizing on machine learning. Um, we've identified that machine learning is, uh, has become super interesting for the early career researcher community. So we've proposed this, um, in, uh, this guided learning and collaborative uh, learning process on machine learning. So we're organizing uh, groups of um, applicants that are interested in learning how to apply machine learning methods to earth system science uh, problems. And we've received a lot of applications uh, from perhaps many of the people who are here at this webinar. Uh, what we're proposing is uh, a process that we've been um, organizing that will go through August to November, in which you will be assigned a group and um, a project, and you will be able to discuss with other early career researchers uh, how to apply this method, how to interpret your results, and then perhaps um, perhaps publish this, this, um, this research. So the application is open and we have a link in the chat, also a link to more information on this. And you can email us with your questions on how this activity will go and, and so on. So I'm happy to present uh, Marlene. Um, Marlene has accepted to give this first webinar and it's a very introductory webinar on machine learning. Uh, since the idea is that this is an activity for people who might not have uh, applied or even engaged in any machine learning um, before. So we, this is a very wide uh, and a very broad uh, webinar. Marlene is a, is a postdoc at the Department of Meteorology at the University of Reading. She holds an individual Marie Curie fellowship and she's applying uh, causal inference methods to evaluate the representation of large scale drivers at the Mediterranean precipitation in seasonal forecast models. And before that, she did her PhD in climate physics at Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research in Germany, where she introduced the concept of causal effect networks and other machine learning algorithms to study teleconnection pathways. Um, so I'm going to give uh, the floor to Marlene, and thank you so much for joining us. Well, hi, thanks. Uh, well, let me first try to share my screen again, hoping this works. Um, so I cannot see the participants anymore, but I'm assuming you can see my, my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Um, 
and thanks Hoya for the nice introduction also for inviting me. And like Hoya said, um, yeah, it's going to be a very broad um, overview on the topic. And well, the reason is, I think it's probably also basically impossible, at least for me to give an, an, an yeah, very exhaustive or a detailed overview about all the different machine learning activities going on, because it's really, it's like, it's a lot. And so in this talk, I will try to focus on, on the bigger picture and kind of the, the, the target audience I had in mind when preparing the, the slides was really um, climate scientists um, who are interested in machine learning, but maybe don't know how to get started or want to yeah, get an overview about what it's all about and uh, where are the challenges. So, um, so in this talk, I will first uh, start with a very brief introduction into machine learning algorithms or the idea of, a, of this type of, uh, of a neural network. And then I will talk about some of the potentials or also recent applications. And then actually uh, at the end, and maybe this is uh, personally for me, the most uh, important part is um, talk about the, the particular challenges uh, when it comes to applying machine learning to climate science. Um, yeah, and I'm hoping for some, some discussions afterwards. All right, so to start, um, let's, yeah, with this overview and there's some, there's a timeline and there's this, yeah, basic cartoon, which I found on the internet and I have been, I've been seeing this a lot because I guess there's already like, or often quite a lot of confusion, at least there was for me, the difference between deep learning, machine learning and AI or artificial intelligence. So, um, and again, this is, I, I don't think there's, let's say an official definition of this, but I think this is um, an easy concept, let's say um, in, in this cartoon. So artificial intelligence is basically everything. So it's really about uh, robots or making machines which can um, perform tasks in an intelligent way, but it's also about the, the hardware. So um, the idea um, is already quite old and um, of course also linked um, to the computer age, but it's really about um, constructing machines which can perform these tasks. But um, in order for machines to be doing something intelligent, we, what we often talk about is the, the machine learning part on AI, which is really the algorithms, so the, the thinking, the mathematics, um, the, the coding, um, which is necessary for machines to do something, um, yeah, uh, for a robot to perform something or just some, I don't know, some Facebook algorithm um, uh, to do some clever uh, stuff and propose you uh, people you or pages you might be interested in. And then in recent years, there's something new, which is called deep learning, which is basically a subfield of machine learning where um, algorithms become more and more complex. And this is of course also raised to um, this increase in computer power. So there's basically this uh, difference between AI, machine learning and deep learning. And I will here focus on, on the machine learning and also the deep learning part. So again, we have these three different things. So machine learning, just very general. I, again, I don't, I don't think this is the official definition, but I just think of this as somehow algorithms which, which can learn from data. So you have some data and an algorithm and it tells you something, it spits you out something. And in the simplest case, it's, you can, uh, well, you could even say um, multiple linear regression is a machine learning algorithm or some k-means clustering, self-organizing maps. So basically uh, maybe some of the algorithms you're already using and <laughs> didn't know that you, you're allowed to call this machine learning. And then the deep learning is basically something a bit more complex, um, names such as recurrent neural networks or deep convolutional networks. So just um, slightly more complex algorithms. And just also three terms which often um, arise are or these three different tasks of machine learning and deep learning um, are these three classes of supervised learning, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. Uh, so the supervised learning really means that you tell the, the algorithm what to do. So for example, you wanted to predict, um, let's say, if it's a, a Nino occurring or not. So this is really um, to tell the algorithm what you want from it. Whereas the unsupervised learning is that you, let's say, you want the algorithm to explore your data and to select some features or some clusters, for instance. And reinforcement learning is more when you have a computer program which interacts in, in some environment and it's you have some um, agent system which must perform a certain goal. But again, this is just to give you these three, uh, these different terms because they often arise. Um, okay, so let's start. And we actually start, or oh, I start with the linear regression because I think it's, uh, well, first of all, it's, it's a very good algorithm and it's widely used. And second, it's also, I think, um, if we think in linear regression, we, it's also easy to understand the rest of um, neural network um, or more complex neural networks. 
So in linear regression, we often have the task that we want to predict um, Y and we want to predict it from X, but X could also be um, uh, different variables. And then, so we, we just fit this line. Uh, so the dots here are the data points and the red line is our, uh, our best fit. And then you can see in these, in these black squares or these black lines, um, so this distance from the fitted line, the red line, and our data points is basically something which we call the error or the bias or something, let's say, um, where um, which tells or the residuals, which tells us that how far we are from the from the actual value. And it's basically about um, minimizing this this bias or minimizing this this error. And um, a different way than to visualize linear regression is this. So we, um, in this case, it's a multiple linear regression. So we have the different X, which are our input data. And then we want, we have this, this circle, uh, which is then in the end, our output uh, Y. Um, and so you basically see as the, the linear regression. So we just say Y is a function of the different X. And we have some regression coefficients, which in the machine learning context are called the weights. So we put a weight on each of the predictors um, to have an optimal prediction of Y. And so it's really finding par parameters uh, which minimize this prediction error. And again, this is this method we probably all know, or maybe uh, some of uh, used already, is this of the least square method. So it's, and it's, let's say with machine learning, it's not, or with other machine learning algorithms, it's, it's not, uh, it's a bit more complicated than this, but this is the, a similar idea. So what they often involve are these neurons. So we, again, we have some input data and we have some output. And then in between there are some, some mathematical operations. Um, we, let's, let's see what these operations are. And again, this is, let's say, at a very basic level. So again, we, what we first need again are these weights. So just as before, regression coefficients. Um, and then we can sum the different weights. And then again, this, we have this bias. So this is basically to say, okay, how far away are we from, from what we predict? And then there's this, this yellow uh, part in this, in this circle, which is um, what is called an activation function. So kind of the, um, the green part from before is, can be put in another function. And this can also be a nonlinear function, um, which can then also give this different results. You can, in a very simple case, you can think of something, a function which you only spits you out zero or one. Uh, so you can yeah, add this nonlinear term. So, but this is basically the, the idea of the neuron. And again, the whole machine learning idea is, it comes from the idea of really the neurons in the brain. So this is um, no coincidence, let's say that they have the similar structure. So we have now our neurons and now we want to go to a neural network. And um, again, a very, very simple case. So we have uh, this input layer, we have this output layer, and then in between we can also have this hidden layer. So you see the different neurons and for the different, different links, we basically want to estimate these weights and we want to um, quantify the bias and we want to minimize this. So we want, um, so basically training a network is giving a network, just like fitting a linear regression slope, it's given its data and trying to minimize its loss. So this is the idea. And then, um, um, of course, it's, it's not, um, the good thing is that now we have computers and algorithms which are um, yeah, able to deal with really complex and um, um, high dimensional data sets. So, um, so we can really, you can think of this, the simple neural network was just one hidden layer, but there can also be many different hidden layers and especially this, um, these uh, number of, of, input, um, uh, of input data is not just uh, like in this picture five, but it can be really high dimensional pictures and so can be the output. So um, it's, um, well, what I kind of the take home part here is that it's really in the way it's, some algebraic mathematical operations, which are not that um, that not that complex, but it's put in such a um, complex high dimensional setting that it's of course it's impossible to to see all the different weights. Um, but the ideas are very very basic and let's say similar to what we do with linear regression. And so what also neural networks or deep learning has been called is let's say linear algebra on steroids. So it's really efficient in, in these parts and in, in getting these, um, these weights and minimizing these, um, these losses. And then there are really different architectures and this is just a, a list or like a nice visualization I found on the internet. So different um, types of, yeah, again, what one calls architectures. So how the different network uh, the hidden layers are performed and how information is flowing forward and backward. And again, it's, it's a long list and it's also, uh, to be honest, not 
um, uh, area of expertise necessarily, but it's just to say there are different ways and uh, which are, um, yeah, which have been constructed for different types of problem settings. Um, the good thing is um, that the internet is really full of information and really full of excellent blog posts and videos. So um, I can really just strongly recommend to, for example, read the different medium blogs and search for neural networks and they're very nice uh, explanations. And um, again, for, for on the one hand, a basic overview, but on also for more um, detailed setups. Okay, so yeah, that's that's the first part on the on the basic idea and the algorithms. Um, but the question, of course, is let's say, uh, yeah, what are the opportunities for climate science? So why are people so so excited about machine learning and um, in, when it comes to climate science as well? So in our daily life, machine learning is of course al uh, already everywhere. But for climate science, this is not maybe not um, always obvious. So I would try to. I uh, list a few applications which have um, already, or machine learning has already have been already been used, and also where one can see potential um, of machine learning applications. The first um, case is that of, of climate modeling. And I think this is where machine learning has um, probably the most use already. Um, again, it's, it's hard to quantify, but this is, let's say my very subjective impression. Um, so, so why, why, why do we think it's, it's useful for climate modeling? So we know when climate models, they have large uncertainties and these large uncertainties are often related to the parameterizations. So of these separate processes. On the right, you see a picture from, this is a paper from Schneider et al. Um, and just visualizing this, let's say our gridded, um, the cause brilliant climate uh, model. And then of course, if you just look at one particular box, there are of course also many processes within this grid box, um, which the model can um, cannot resolve explicitly. So where we have this parameterization, which are in a way just some, yeah, um, empirical uh, ways uh, to fit the data where people of course know what might be going on, but they're of course not perfect. And especially in the case of clouds, it's it's, it's well known that many of the uncertainties, for example, when it comes to climate sensitivity are related to these parameterizations. So an uh, idea which I think arise already well, uh, uh, 10 years ago um, or so, is that um, one can learn these parameterizations from the data directly. So we have now high resolution data, resolution data. So why not learn the parameterization from some clever machine learning algorithm instead of scientists, let's say, do this heuristically or um, trying out different different ways which might fit. And so there's really um, yeah, a lot of progress um, on, this, uh, on this topic or a lot of um, publications at least. Um, for example, there's also a, just a, a recent special collection, uh, which I think is really uh, looks really great, is um, the machine learning for weather and climate modeling and the uh, philosophical transaction A. Uh, where it's really just dedicated to, to this problem of using machine learning for climate modeling. And at least when it comes to clouds, again, there are some, some uh, great papers. Um, and I'm actually referring to a nice blog post from Stefan Rask here, that um, there is some progress, but there's also lots to do. So it's not as easy as just fit the data and then we put in our climate model. Um, but there are really some, still some instabilities when this is coupled. So, uh, Probably also a second um, take home message here is that it's um, when it comes to the actual data, it's actually complicated. And climate models, are of course, so complex that it's not uh, just tuning this one parameter will make everything perfect. Um, but there's definitely, let's say, the hope that we can build a new generation of climate models where machine learning plays a key role. And there are, of course, also large activities where this is already done. Um, a second key application is that of, of forecasting. So um, this is in an essence, of course, also what machine learning does. It gives, you take input data and it gives you, and it predicts you something or it gives you an output. And um, so in climate sense, we of course, uh, we have different um, um, time ranges of forecasting. So we have from, from weather forecasting to climate forecast. And in between we have sub-seasonal to seasonal, we have the seasonal, we have the de decadal forecast. So um, different, different models, different tasks. Um, so, but actually let's say all we have at the moment, or well, it's quite a lot, are dynamical climate models. So we use climate models, which are based on, on physics, um, 
Uh, but like as you know in the previous slide, um, these models also have flaws and for example, related to parameterizations. And also running these models, of course, it's very expensive and computationally expensive. And again, and the forecast skill is often limited, especially when it comes to these um, timescales between weather and climate. So another, let's say, key idea where machine learning could, could help us is to use um, yeah, machine learning methods to, to do the prediction for us. So it's about using um, pre statistical predictions based on, uh, based on machine learning uh, algorithms. Um, on the left, there's a picture from, um, from a nature paper from Lamet in 2019, where they um, did this to uh, forecast uh, ENSO, so the ENSO phase. And uh, we know for ENSO, that's actually there's this so-called spring predictability barrier. So uh, with dynamical models, um, let's say also struggling to predict this um, in advance or before spring. And in this paper, they, um, yeah, I think it's really great. So they combine different the input data from sea surface temperature, but also then from, I think the HP is for ocean oceanic uh, heat content at different time lags. They train a model and they actually also combine both historical runs um, from CMIP models as well as reanalysis data. And then they predict, so the, the output is just a single, um, single value for the uh, NINO 3.4 index. And, but they can show that they're able to um, actually um, year to prediction uh, lead times up to one and a half years. So um, let's say it looks impressive. There's also another recent paper, I think it's still on, uh, it's, I think it's on archive or on Earth, Earth archive from Anderson et al from the Cambridge group where they use um, um, also they train a deep uh, neural network for seasonal sea ice forecasting. And they also, uh, they also show that they get uh, high skills and beating some of the dynamical models for lead times, um, I think three or four months ahead or up to six months ahead. So yeah, one key point, but of course this is, um, this is not, um, not all the papers. So again, apologies if I miss important papers here, but it's, uh, I think again, this second application is really the forecasting part, but there again, there are much more. And I'm here showing a picture from, from a nice paper by Reichstein at Island Nature, which is then actually a deep learning overview paper. So I can strongly recommend it. And, um, what they what they list is a few applications from from typical machine learning task and how this might be relevant for for earth science task or for climate science and the first one here is this of um uh, object classification so the typical case on the left is we have a picture and you want um the algorithm should tell us whether it sees a cat or a dog or uh, how certain it is and of course, we, we in climate science, we also have pictures. We have our, um, we have satellite images, or in this case, it's, it's output from a, from a um, climate model, but it's about uh, pattern classification. So in within this image, it's about uh, classifying these, these uh, eddies or vortices. Um, a second task is that of, um, again, the machine learning task is kind of a super resolution um, uh, and fusion, so we have some input data, and it's but it's very it's blurry, and then a machine learning model can basically predict um, or can be trained to predict kind of the brown truth, and then for for our earth science context, this is of course for example related uh, related to to downscaling issues, and this has actually also been applied already. Um, a different um, a different application case might be um, well that of video prediction where we have different time frames and it's about predicting the next time frame um, where machine learning is already uh, used a lot. The, the kind of related earth science task is that of a short term forecast and, and now casting as well where we can really just based on the state of now predict uh, the next output in a way so similar as uh, weather forecasting but again in a statistical sense. And the last example they give in this in this one figure is that of um, from the machine learning tab, which is language translation. So there's a sentence, an input sentence from from English, and it's um, um, uh, translated into German. And then also the number of uh, let's say this is of course also challenging because the number of input and output data does not have to um, overlap. And uh, um, a task from the earth science is um, the dynamic time series modeling where we kind of have the, the real versus the predicted uh, value of a time series. So, um, and well, I'm pretty sure again, 
that this uh, this list is not complete. So there will be many uh, many others, and well, probably as we speak, there are already papers again submitted. So um, again, depending on the different on the different disciplines and also your research interest, um, there might be already some applications out there where machine learning uh, is already uh, applied and used. Um, and I want to take, um, I guess, like the next uh, 10 minutes or so for, for actually talking about challenges and um, so why, why it's not straightforward to use machine learning and climate science and what I think where the different challenges uh, lie for the next, for the next years. Um, so, so let's do this. And um, to start with the challenges, I, um, I've been shown this in, in, different, uh, in different talks, but I really love this XKCD comic which I think really perfectly um, summarizes the issue. So it's, it's three scientists talking and they, uh, one says it's our field has been struggling with this problem for years. And then the machine learning person comes, says struggle no more, I'm here to solve it with algorithms. Um, then he, in this case, um, gets to work, starts coding, but six months later, uh, realize, wow, this problem is really hard. And the scientists, uh, of course, are not surprised and just say, you don't say. So, um, so, well, I think the point here for me is that we, on the one hand, we have, let's say it requires both machine learning uh, scientists, but also the domain scientists to actually really make progress on a problem. And also it shows that it's uh, not easy to just apply an algorithm to, to complex data. And especially in the case of climate science, um, many clever people have been thinking about difficult problems for, for a long time. So this is not to say that machine learning won't help us. I think it will, or it will definitely help us because it gives us a new way to look at the data. But um, I think we definitely have to acknowledge that it's not solving everything and it, it's um, not as easy as running a code. And um, yeah, kind of to, um, yeah, to give a more detailed maybe reason for this, um, I like this. Um, I think this is a perspective paper or some comment in, in Nature Machine Intelligence, so it's not related to climate science, but a general one. Um, the paper is called um, Accurate Data-Driven Prediction Does Not Mean High Reproduci Reproducibility. So it's basically about saying that um, predictions um, also can, or correct predictions can be correct for the wrong reasons. Um, so there is some, this graphic, um, and I want to try to guide you through this. So. What you see is you have this box. So this is the obs our observational world. So this is data we have. So we have data and uh, we have our prediction model. Again, we want to predict Y and um, we from some input data, X1, uh, X2, X3, but of course it could be many more. So this is a very simplified um, version again. So and this can be, there can be, it's accurate. We can test if our prediction matches the data and we can make these cross validation points. Um, what we do, so we, um, so the arrow from um, from the right to the uh, the bottom uh, to the bottom, um, is that we we basically estimate the joint probability distribution from our data. So we just see from past values um, when we had when x one two three were in certain states, what uh, did uh, how did uh, y like or what did uh, y do, and then just based on this um, joint probability distribution, we make our prediction. So this is what linear regression does, but also what um, machine learning algorithms do. It's fitting the data from the past to make predictions of the future. Um, okay, so, but now let's think of the physical world. So there is one true causal mechanism, or so one true causal model in this case. So the different mechanisms are in a way interrelated. Here the arrows stand for causal relationships. So in this case, X2 is driving both X1 and Y, and Y drives two. So these different mechanisms, they generate the data we see, but we don't know what the true mechanisms are. The problem is that there are usually different uh, possible causal st structures which fit the data. So um, in this case, there are, there are four different ones, how the different causal relationships could be, which would result in the same conditional dependency. So it's kind of a joint probability distribution, uh, which, we, uh, which we model. Um, but it does not mean that the, the causal structure is the correct one. So in other words, we can have, so we can have good predictions from the past, but it does not mean that they, that the future predictions will be true because it's, it's of course certainly possible that we um, make predictions for the wrong reasons or that we just had basically a wrong causal assumptions in mind. A similar, a very simple case would be that um, if we just have X and Y and let's say X is the, 
um, the barometer and why is the pressure we measure, then we can of course use um, the measured um, the measured pressure as a good predictor for the pressure. But it does not mean um, that. Uh, but the causal relationship is of course the other way around. So we we should not confuse association with causation. And and I think one very crucial part in the context of climate science where this is so relevant to keep in mind is that that climate data is of course non-stationary. So it's it's changing because we have climate change. So if we fit something to past um, data. Um, it does not mean that these dependencies or these statistical associations that there's necessarily there in the future, just because our climate is changing. So um, this is, I think, um, a key thing we have to, to keep in mind, especially in the climate change context. But of course, there are ways, let's say, to, to overcome this or to, um, to approach this problem. And one, uh, I call it your option, but of course, you can actually, it's part of this uh, many different applications of machine learning. And the one is kind of this opening the black box. So um, kind of the uh, from the previous slide, one of the problems or criticisms is that we don't know why our model made a, a prediction. We, we fit our data, we get a prediction, but we don't really know why. Mm -hmm. So there's this um, kind of field from called explainable AI. And the, the idea of explainable AI is really to reveal uh, why a neural network made a decision. Um, there are different different ways. There are so-called local and global um, algorithms, but um, there's one, for example, which is called layer-wise relevance propagation, LRP, uh, which is about revealing the most important pixels from the input files. And um, I'll I guide you through this, um, this picture in a second. Um, so it's really, let's say, the idea of opening the black box is, is, let's say, train the neural network to make a prediction and then apply another algorithm to, to learn why the model made a certain a certain prediction. Um, and again, so for this LRP, this has already been uh, used quite a lot in climate science, um, for example, uh, especially in the group by, uh, by Libby Barnes in Colorado. Um, so yeah, there were there are several papers to, to put here. Um, so have, they have been using this method LRP. And there's on the left um, kind of an example uh, what you would get from such a method. So in this case, uh, you have a picture um, of a horse um, and you train a neural network and you want your neural network to tell you um, what you see. So you want something with, well, it tells you a horse, for example. So the, let's say the neural network um, made a correct prediction, but now you want to know why the neural network thought it was a horse in the first place. So applying um, LRP would give you this, um, this uh, heat maps, as you see on the right. So basically in red are the pixels which are relevant uh, for the decisions and the blue may be less relevant. So in blue you see, for example, the house was not relevant, but um, the red ones you see the, the legs of the horse and the, um, yeah, the, I don't know, I don't know what the English term is, but the, the ears and the, the face of the horse. Um, where um, this caused, let's say, that this caused your neural network to tell you it's a horse. Um, you also see this funny thing um, on below. This is, um, and you can see this is kind of a, um, the impression from the photographer. So the neural network thought that this is also relevant for the prediction. And here, this is called the, the clever Hans effect. The reason is that um, when the model was trained from, from in, with input data, so when yeah it was uh, yeah, trained with data, a lot of photos from this one photographer, photographer were used. Um, and this photographer always has made photos of horses. So there is this association, which is non-causal. So um, this is, let's say, one of these funny um, ex um, examples where a neural network learned something, made a correct prediction, but for the wrong reasons. Um, but, um, and this is why these explainable AI methods are so, so relevant. Um, there's also a nice uh, BAMS paper by, by Amy McGovern, um, which also um, discusses this in the context of, of weather forecasting. But I think for me, the point is really that um, being able to, uh, to explain what the network learned is really an essential step to build trust in, in new methods. Um, yeah, otherwise, especially when physicists, they don't like black boxes. Um, and so this is, I think, uh, really, really relevant research in that respect. Um, a second part, this is, um, this is actually the thing uh, I'm uh, working on now. Um, I did, for example, my, my PhD on. So um, yeah, forgive me that I also mentioned this here, but the second part is of uh, that on, on causal discovery. So I talked a lot about association causality uh, when, it, when it comes to problems, but there's also one class of 
machine learning algorithms, not necessarily deep learning, but machine learning, um, which, which aim it is to learn causal structures from data. So again, kind of trying to overcome this problem of pure association to get a level higher and to say, okay, is X causing Y or is Y causing X? And there's this one, or there again, there are different um, algorithms. There's one which uh, I've been using, which is called the PCMCI algorithm, uh, which is based on the so-called PC algorithm. So um, yeah, many algorithms, um, which is um, for time, which has been implemented um, for time series data. And again, it, it has as input, it has different time series representing different processes, and the output is a causal structure. Um, there's one example on the right, this is from a paper from 2016, where we applied this algorithm to study different teleconnections in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, in this particular case, it's about finding out whether sea ice loss in the Barents and Karas ice region, so this is this BKSIC uh, node, um, if this um, affects mid-latitude circulation, in particular the polar vortex. And again, so we applied this method, it's, it kind of tests through different iterations and tests for conditional dependencies um, and finds this um, kind of the output which shown here in kind of the causal structure or the, the learned causal structure, which of course also involves a lot of assumptions. But um, at least in the, in the case on the context of um, teleconnections, there are already quite a few papers also by Georgia de Capua and also many others. And um, um, so this causal discovery algorithm, these are based on so-called causal inference methods. So this is, let's say, part of statistics, really, or from mathematics. And I think really, well, for me personally, the most um, excited uh, research on, on machine learning or on deep learning is really kind of combining causal inference with machine learning. So it's really how can we make these neural networks uh, causal? And this is, um, yeah, definitely cutting edge research. There's a, a paper by Barenboim and Pearl and um, PNAS three years ago, and I just saw yesterday that there's also um, a paper on posted on archive where they seem to make progress on this topic with very uh, yeah, high level authors. So um, I, I'm not really aware of any implications in, in the climate science context yet. Um, well, forgive me if there are, but um, yeah, again, this is just my very personal view. I think this is um, definitely something um, worth paying attention to. Um, this somehow links to this problem bit of interpretability and accuracy. And this is actually, um, yeah, almost I come to the end of the talk. So it's really kind of this trade off what we want with our method. Are we fine if it's just a prediction and our model is really fine uh, and our model is performing well, or are we interested in, in, in the results and the, the causal structures? And there is no, there's no easy answer, or there is no answer to this. It really dep depends uh, from case to case and from, from the research question. So kind of the, a, boring, a boring answer, um, but yeah, it's, it's not as easy as one can think. And this is from a book chapter from Tom uh, Boisler, um, which I liked. Um, so we have this three-dimensional uh, space. We may just focus first on the, the green uh, axis. This is interpretability. Then we have the orange axis, which is the number of parameters, basically how complex is the model. And then the blue axis, the physical structures, but this is maybe one you can ignore for the moment. And then in the yellow, in the, sorry, in the orange boxes, in this plane from the green and the orange um, plane, um, you have different algorithms. So, hoping it's now, you have from, uh, for example, we have something like linear regression or cluster algorithms. Um, they, on the interpretability dimension, they're really easy to interpret. And, but it gets also more complicated in terms of representation and number of parameters to deep neural networks. But there is some trade-off between uh, interpretability and the number of parameters. And number of parameters can also, of course, mean that it's better to fit your data and to represent your data. And really, depending on your problem, and uh, you have to choose a method and also then um, kind of the ways to, to deal with these issues. Um, uh, and like a related problem, I think is really um, is one of ethics. And um, this is again a paper from Nature Machine Intelligence, nothing which has nothing to do with climate science, but I think it's also relevant or definitely relevant for climate science. And um, it's very recent, but already really, uh, highly cited. It's um, stop explaining black box machine learning models for high stakes decision and use interpretable models instead. And I think this again comes to the question: if it's if we have um, if we make predictions to to stakeholders, to people um, about climate change, we of course also need to explain why. And 
And in this case, she argues that just using methods from explainable AI is not in enough. Um, and but I think the general point is really that there are of course ethical applications of, of algorithms in general. Um, all right, so so last slide. So summary or the way forward. Um, yeah, good question. Um, let me give you again a very personal or um, subjective perspective. So first of all, machine learning and deep learning algorithms, they offer really several new ways to analyze data. So I think we, we should really be um, excited about this because it's just it's new tools to look at the data. Um, but there is really no single best method. It always depends on the guiding research question. And um, so what the problem? And I think really the, the, the problem should also guide the choice of the method. If you have a key problem, think of which machine learning method can help you or do the other way around. If you have a poor method, think of the problem it can answer. But um, we should really, let's say, try to, to do, do these resources in the most meaningful way. Um, I think the basic idea is quite simple um, with neural networks and it's you can really code a neural network um, easily and just follow some tutorials on the internet, but the devil lies, of course, in the details. And this is, I think everybody who works with climate data knows this, that um, when it comes to pre-processing already, and um, there's, let's say, where the problem starts. So that's there are the scientific problems behind this. So the key challenge, again, in my opinion, is that it's really about combining machine learning methods with domain expertise. So how can we really get the most, with a new method, the most of the data, but not ignoring all the knowledge we already have on the system? And this, and this requires or this needs, and here comes um, different names, which I think for essentially the same things, physics guided or knowledge driven, interpreter, causal, hybrid machine learning. So in a way, it's, it's all similar. It's not just using data science, it's not just using the science, but it's, it's combining them and combining them in a, in a meaningful way. And of course, this requires knowledge on the methods, but also on the data generating processes. And maybe just generally in the, um, Interdisciplinary work um, takes a lot of time. So if you work together with um, machine learners, for instance, it takes time to find a common uh, yeah, um, language, but it's definitely worth the effort. So I think we can we'll see very um, many advantages. And I'd like to just finish with this quote from Alan Turing, which I like a lot. Uh, I think it fits for many occasions, but especially when it comes to machine learning and climate science. And he said, uh, well, this uh, back then uh, with respect to computer science, but um, Again, it fits still now. So we can see, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty that needs to be done. So yeah, thanks. Maybe or uh, hoping there are some questions. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we have a lot of questions already. So you can post your questions in the chat, but I'm gonna start reading them out loud um, on my land to answer. So the first question that we have is uh, from, Subin Jose, if we try to learn deduce parameterization scheme with mach using machine learning, how far it will be in agreement with physical laws? In what, uh, yeah, trying to, in what perspective are do we stand now with respect to that? Well, that's a very good question. And uh, where the short answer, I don't know where, because this is really not my expertise. Um, so I definitely saw talks. And again, I think, for example, of the work of Tom, Tom Beisler, um, where they really built in physical constraints or physical uh, laws um, so that the machine, the algorithms behaved, I don't know, conservation of energy. Um, which, as, as far as I can judge, of course, improved, let's say, the interpretability and um, the performance, I guess, uh, or hope. Um, but I cannot give an, an answer, let's say, what's the state of the art now. Um, again, this, I read this, this blog post from Stefan Rasp where he really argues that um, at the moment, it's still, let's say, too, too early to judge because the applications which uh, had been done already, they were really more for aqua planet models. So I think it seems like there's still like a, way, a long way to go, but I guess it's also clear that um, the models or the algorithms need to uh, behave in a physical consistent way, otherwise they, they're not really meaningful to us. So um, maybe someone in the audience knows better, but uh, I'm, not the, I'm not the modeling person, unfortunately. No, that's great. So um, we have another question. 
uh, thanking you for the great overview from Saraba Rathore. Please excuse me if I'm not pronouncing your names correctly. Um, so I also want to know if there's any temporal limitation for the prediction. For example, how short the time scale to how long a time scale we can mm. successfully predict. I guess that depends on the method. Maybe you can elaborate how to yeah. have a clue on this. I guess it first depends on the on the physics actually. So I mean, it's the question of predictability and there are limits to predictability. We know we cannot predict whether a year ahead or even a month ahead, but we can. We know we can predict. Um, but we know we can predict averages quite well. So we are not able to say how the weather will be in 100 years, but we, the different boundary conditions uh, taking into account, we can say how warm the, the global mean average will be. So I think in the first place, it's the question of physics, of, of predictability. So how much predictability is there? And then the methods, it's more about squeezing out the signal and using it in the most meaningful way. And um, well, I don't see, well, I think we have reasons to believe that machine learning will be very good in this because it is so powerful in extracting these complex interdependencies in the, in the model. Um, how to do it then and how to, yeah, train your model, train your model combining um, climate model simulations, observations. I think this is then again, this, this is then the scientific task. Um, but in terms of, um, of the model kind of squeezing out the most of the signal. I think this is, I'm pretty sure that machine learning models will generally beat simple linear regression models, for instance, where we just have, let's say, an, an ENSO index to predict temperatures in, in North America. Um, but yeah, the question I think is again related to both the physics and the, and the mathematics. Thank you, great. Uh, so from Shivam, is it possible to build a machine learning or neural network model that is aware of the physics behind the problem? Super hard questions. <laughs> yeah, um, I hope there is, I'm sure there is in a way, but I do think it's still in its infancy. So, I mean, there is this, I think this CLIMA initiative in, in Stanford where they um, have a they, they build a, a climate model, but where the um, parameterizations I uh, learned from, um, from machine learning algorithms. And again, there are definitely papers where people um, try to, especially in the climate modeling context, um, where they kind of impose the physical laws and um, to make this consistent with physics. Um, but let's say how long it will take to have a perfect, or I don't think it's pop uh, possible to have a perfect, machine learning only based methods to predict the earth system, or I think it will take a lot of time, let's say, to beat the dynamical models, or I don't know how much time, but it will take some time. Uh, some time. Um, so I guess one future, which, or, well, let's say one pathway is also kind of this hybrid modeling approach. It's really combining or taking the best of both worlds. Um, yeah, but again, definitely lots, lots to do and uh, lots to, um, yeah to do research on. Thank you, Marlene. Uh, there is one previous question from Saurabh Rathor. Uh, he asked, why there is no interactions between the hidden layers? Do they interact or do or not during the process? Ah, uh, no, they can They can interact. Again, they're different. They're different architectures and different levels of complexity and how, um, yeah, the layers interact. This was really, or the, let's say the, the pictures I showed were really just to give the very basic idea what a neural network is. So starting with neurons, starting with the, the biases and the weights, but then, um, yeah, there are different levels of complexity. Uh, there's one for from Hemadri Buzanamat. He said, thanks, Marlene. Nice presentation. My question is, I see the seasonal prediction and extending range, range prediction for Indian summer monsoon are pretty good for the Indian subcontinent. Do you think machine learning can improve skills compared to the current global climate model? And also, do you think the machine learning can take over the numerical weather prediction models? Yeah, um, again, I, it's, it's well, I don't want to judge about an entire 
um, research domain or industry. So um, I don't know. I don't think they will take over entirely, um, but I think they can do some of the parts maybe um, the current dynamical models can cannot do. For example, when it comes to provide um, cheap predictions away, so it's quite costly to run a, um, a climate model. So I think it's, it will be relevant or maybe to, to optimize some of the steps or for the um, post-processing, for instance. So my models are biased and maybe we can just learn better uh, better, better ways to for the statistical post-processing of model outputs. So personally, I think, or I've seen in, in, a, in a recent conference, I have seen uh, one approach, I forgot, unfortunately, um, who the authors were, where they really try to build a, um, a forecast model, but really just a statistical one, so based on machine learning. But personally, I think I'm most excited about the best ways to combine to really take the best of both worlds. So this is um, where, let's say, where my research energy goes into. Um, yeah, but again, I think we, sh we can, or we should expect a lot from machine learning, um, but still, it's we should not forget how much uh, research already was dedicated to building really good physical models and uh, how much knowledge there is on the system. So yeah, again, that's me arguing for combining the two. Great. Um, so we have another one from Suvin Jose. Is there any threshold related to the amount of data for getting a better prediction? Um, well, maybe no. So I think, um, so nowadays we have very good computers and maybe it might take uh, a week uh, to run something, but I don't think that this is necessarily necessarily the current limit. I think the problem is rather in the overfitting issue, which is if you give it, uh, if you have a lot of, uh, if you have a lot of parameters and you, you fit it, um, it's of course easy to overfit, and you will notice then when you make an out of sample prediction uh, that the skip uh, suddenly drops. So um, having a lot of data is of course good, especially again in climate context where we have different oscillations and different um, time scales and spatial scales and different dependencies. Um, but I don't think it's just about data. So um, I think, yeah, again, this is my personal research bias, but we think we should think of uh, causal structures um, to prevent this and not just on the getting more and more data by, um, side. Great, thanks. Um, so we have another technical question. Fasal uh, asks, do we calculate mean of raster images of an area for a random forest regression model or do we have to convert it into the array from the development of the model? Oh, that's a very technical one. I think I'm going to not say something wrong, um, but yeah. I know there's a nice um, there's a nice random forest paper which uh, I would have to Google now, but um, mm -hmm. I can look it up and maybe send it around. But uh, sorry, uh, I don't know. Yeah, that's <laughs> super technical. Oh, okay, I'm gonna read out one more. Um, many many comments thanking you for the for the talk. Uh, so, how will machine learning be able to handle commercially available technologies that are operating already, especially those that contribute to climate change, especially burning fossil fuels. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Not sure I understood it. Yeah, so it says, uh, how will machine learning able to handle commercially available technologies that are operating already or yeah, um, that's the first part of the question. So uh, how might, might machine learning allow handling commercially available technologies, uh, especially those that contribute to climate change, especially burning fossil fuels? Perhaps yeah. is that clear to you or you could uh, um, write your I, Well, I guess I could interpret it in two different ways. Let me just maybe look at okay. <laughs> Um, but definitely possible I misunderstood. So I think the first part I would rather understand that say how we could maybe even use this existing technologies and platforms. Um, so maybe this is more on the big data side. Um, and then I guess there are of course larger initiatives such as Pangeo where it's really about also using large data platforms um, 
to run our models and to to save our data but again i have no idea if this is the direction of the question the, the second part as it seems that let maybe again to an ethical question or the question of um how can we as a community maybe fight the climate crisis um that's of course also a big question um i guess also big companies now or oh, i hope most of them are aware that they um have to do something or they have to reduce their their carbon emissions so yeah the optimist in me let's say hopes they will contribute um well there's also a pessimist side in, in in me but um yeah i think i'm i'm not sure now what the question is exactly but uh so i hope it answers at least partly thank you so valentina would you like to I'll read out the last two questions. Uh, Hugh, Hugh, Hugh Lim says, um, could you introduce a bit more overlifting, overfitting issue? I'm sorry, overfitting issue. I'm wondering how can I avoid overfitted models? Mm. Okay, so maybe very generally, let's say we can think of, uh, let's think of linear regression again, or um, let's say we have 20 data points and we have, uh, 20 predictors, then of course we can always have a perfect prediction. We can just fit the model that such a in such a way that uh, that it matches um, the data. So this is just to say that um, the more parameters you have, of course, you the more prone you are to overfitting. Making a case again for simple linear regression models where we have basically the least number of uh, model parameters. Um, yeah, and then I think the the usual way to do this is to kind of splitting data into training, validation, test uh, periods, and to see how the accuracy uh, changes. Um, so I think this is the, the usual approach um, to see if uh, we're not overfitting. So the test accuracy is usually, of course, the highest, but it should not drop dramatically um, when it's, um, sorry, the training accuracy, of course, the highest, but it should not drop dramatically upon the test accuracy. Um, again, this, this one paper I highlighted, um, this again makes the case that um, even if the accuracy is high, this again does not mean you can uh, reproduce this with different data. And then again, the, the reason is again in the, in the causal structure. So um, let's say it's not everything is um, just the test accuracy also when it comes to overfitting. But if you want to really the explanations, I think we yeah, have to take the causal parts into account. But again, depending on what you want with your research or what, what, what it is you're after. Thank you. And the last question is from Thierry Zaguera. He said, uh, thank you, Marlan, for your presentation. Please, do you think machine learning can help to identify the main process in a region where rainfall depends on many processes? Hmm. Yeah, good question. And let's say this one is yeah rather related to my, <laughs> to my research. Um, well, yes and no. I think I think machine learning is very good also in an explorative sense, let's say to detect patterns, to see where we have dependencies, where we, um, every time we have extreme rainfall, why there's, like, I don't know, the SSTs in the Pacific, why they're also in some anomalous state. So I think kind of for this explorative part, definitely, and also for the prediction, probably. Um, but then again, we know, let's say, ignoring machine learning for a second, we know how complicated things are, especially in the, for example, the large scale drivers. So we know that El Nino Southern Oscillation also is related to the phase of the Medendrian Oscillation, which also affected by the phase of the, the QBO, which is related to the polar vortex. So it's everything is both, uh, let's say, correlated both in space and time. So um, I'm hoping that machine learning will help us to better understand these different processes, but machine learning alone, um, no, I don't think so. So I think we have to, uh, again, use the physics, use the knowledge to, um, yeah, to understand the system better. Um, but again, this is not to say that that I don't believe in that machine learning will help us. But I just say I don't think we should just put all our hopes on machine learning. But it's, yeah, this knowledge guided, physics guided um, way, which of course also is now uh, a term widely used. I think this is, um, yeah, the interesting part. Okay, I'm gonna thank Marlene again. Thank you so much for 
uh, accepting this challenge of giving this very broad <laughs> um, webinar. I think it's been great and there's a lot of interest. Um, and thank you all for your questions. So I just want to briefly say that we're going to have a second webinar on this topic, which is going to be on July 29th. Um, and it's going to be by Jean, Dr. Jean Gao from University of Delaware. She will be talking about data-driven spatial temporal modeling for long-term human and environmental interactions. Um, so, so yeah, we're gonna be waiting you uh, there and you can register in the link in the chat box. So thanks again, Marlene. And thank, thank you, you everyone for joining. Okay.